As parents and youth workers, we're eager to see our kids come to faith in Christ and to grow in maturity in Christ. Research and experience are pointing to the fact that some of the greatest strides kids make in their faith happen in the camp setting. What happens to kids when they go to Christian camp? How has Christian camping changed over the course of the last few years? And what can parents and youth workers do to encourage a positive camping experience that yields real life change in the kids they know and love? With Summertime Fast approaching, you'll want to listen in as we talk about the benefits and blessings of Christian camping with three camping experts on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Camp. That's what we're going to talk about on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. And before we jump into a great conversation with three of our friends who know camp very well, what about the three of us? How well do we know camp? And I want to ask you, Jason Soshenik in Spokane, yes, you have camps out there, don't you? <laughs> we do, we do. but I, I didn't grow up going to camp okay, out here. Yeah. I went to a camp in Arizona. Okay. I thought you might have camps because you guys just got electricity. Uh, but I want to talk about I want to talk about camps and Chris, what your experience was like at camp. So here's the question. All right, um, your 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 earliest memory of summer camp. What's your earliest memory of summer camp? And keep it keep it to a few sentences. You got one, Jason? Earliest memory of summer camp. Do you remember the name of the camp you went to? Yeah, it was camp. Uh, it was called Camp Montlure, and uh, it was in. It's about five hours away from Phoenix, Arizona, and I, I, I remember it. But I, I how old were going, you? How old? I was thirteen. Okay. And it was the first place where um, I learned uh, about the gospel, and it was it was the place where I, I came to know the Lord. And um, <laughs> but I would, in all honesty, I, I um, came to love the camp. Uh, in my early years, more for the dances we had. I knew it was going down this road. The girls I would get to meet than it, than it was about me growing in my faith. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know that changed over the years, but that was definitely something I just remember. Yeah. So did you did you, know. did you make crafts there? You know, like the, remember the craft did shed I, at camp? Did did they have like a craft <laughs> yeah. room or a craft shed? <laughs> No, we. I. I think I avoided that shed. Okay, think, all right. You I think I. I tried to find uh, other activities. <laughs> what about you, Chris? Uh, I grew up going to uh, family camp, a CMA family camp every year. But um, what was the name of that? Was it at a particular camp, or was it through your church? Uh, yeah, it was at a particular camp. Goodness, what was the name of that? Western PA. Uh, no, it was up in New York. Okay, New York. Uh, I. Well, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on it, but. Uh, it's right there into my tongue. Anyways, uh, so I d- did a lot of family camp, but then the the first I, I ended up going to you know camp there as a kid. My, but the very first year that I went to camp was specifically a basketball camp. So I remember that basketball camp pretty well. That was kind of my first on my own uh, camping experience. Overnight? That was yeah, an overnight. Yeah, camp? Week, yeah, a week week long overnight. How old were you? Um, I want to say ten. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I could be off a year. Good experience. There, did you get yeah, homesick? I lo- no, I loved it. I I I went to camp every year after that, you know, as long as I as long as they would let me. Yeah, Jason, did you get homesick your first time at camp? Delta no, Lake, not by at the all. Way. Delta Lake, okay. <laughs> you didn't at all. You no. were thirteen. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Did you get homesick? Yeah, I did. I think it was ten. I think it was nineteen sixty six. Okay. Maybe it was nine. My birthday's in the summer, which meant I always got ripped off at school because I never had a birthday party. You guys might want to think about that and make up for that because that's still a a big void in my life because I was born at the end of July. But yeah, so I was nine or 10 and I went to Four Brooks, which was in Pipersville, Pennsylvania. It was our denominational camp, Four Brooks Camp and Bible Conference. And I got homesick. I remember the room I was in, there were bunks and I think it was just a room for two. And I just, the first night, just bawled my eyes out. It just hit me. I remember it was devastating. 
And I found uh, my parents gave me a little box camera to take along with me. And I found recently the photos that I took at camp. And there was a picture of the guy who was my roommate there. He was probably my age, I'm guessing. And if it hadn't been for my mom writing notes on the back of all my photos, I would not have known his name. But his name was on the back. And several months ago, I went to Facebook, and I found him. And he's a pastor now in the Philadelphia area. Kind of cool. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and I asked cool. I asked about the crafts. It, so he and I reconnected. But I asked about the crafts because I still have. I'll have to bring them in and show you, Chris. You're gonna be really impressed. <laughs> I have the salt and pepper shakers I made at Camp Sankanek. Basically, <laughs> they were pre-made, that's, and I just that's the way that's uh that's wood burned, some craft shed. I know I you, wood burned. I wood burned an S shakers? on one, an S on one, and a P on the other. Do you know what that was for? Yes. <laughs> so I, I wood burned on there and then and then shellacked them. And we still have them at the house. We don't use them, but they sit up in a cam that is a reminder of camp. So, yeah, camp. Oh, what a great <laughs> – you know, camp's a great thing, and it's good that we That's remember awesome. that. It's wonderful, and yeah. camp has changed a lot. I think we're much more yes, – serious about camp we're intentional about camp there are many more camps i know i've had the opportunity over the last several years to be a part every year of speaking at the 3ca conference that's christian camping and conference association and i've been very impressed with how much goes into camp and the thoughtfulness of camp and the strategies with camp and that's what we're going to talk about today we're going to bring on uh, three friends who are involved with camp. We'll introduce them after we take a break here. And we're going to have a conversation about camp and the benefits of camp and things that youth workers and parents need to be thinking about as the summer approaches and as we think about what role camp can play in the spiritual development, the emotional development, you know, the life development of our children and teens. So stick with us. We'll be right back. We're excited to announce that one of our most popular CPYU resources of all time has just been released in an updated and revised format. Tens of thousands of kids have been trained by their parents and youth workers to think Christianly about music and media with our How to Use Your Head to Guard Your Heart 3D Guide to Making Wise Media Choices. This easy-to-use teaching tool needs to be in your youth ministry toolbox if you desire to teach your students to integrate their faith into all of life. Jesus calls us to follow him, and that includes following him into the six to nine hours a day of screen time that shape and mold the beliefs and behaviors of our kids. To learn more about our 3D Media Evaluation Guide and to order a copy for every member of your youth group, go to our website at cpyu.org. Teach your kids to engage with media to the glory of God. I'm Walt Mueller, and this is Youth Culture Matters, and Jason and I are going to have a uh, conversation today with some friends of ours who are involved in camping, and we've talked a little bit up to this point about camping, but we want to hear from some guys who are deeply embedded in the world of camping in a variety of different ways and in a variety of different places, and I'm excited about this because now is the time that youth workers and parents are thinking about camp for the summer for the kids that they know and love. And if they aren't thinking about it, you should be thinking about it. I'm a big believer in camp, and these folks will help you understand why that is. So we'll start with, let me introduce them one at a time and just tell you briefly about who they are, where they're from, and I'll let them then tell you about uh, what's unique about what they're doing. But Rob Ribby, Dr. Rob Ribby, is at Wheaton College. He is Assistant Professor of Christian Formation and Ministry, And he is the director of Honey Rock, which he'll tell us more about. But, Rob, thanks for coming on. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot for having us. Uh, Honey Rock is uh, the outdoor center for leadership development at Wheaton. And what's unique about Honey Rock is that we use the camp environment as a a laboratory for experiential leadership development of youth, the campers, as well as the college students. So... uh, our camp setting in the summer, uh, college students are participating in college-based 
uh, training and coursework and then applying their learning throughout the summer experience with the high school kids in the wilderness or in camp in the residential program. Uh, and then we also have a graduate program that equips people to be leaders in camp ministry. So really unique combination of camp and college here at Honey Rock. Just, just curious, Rob, uh, how long has that graduate program been going? Uh, our first graduate courses taught at Honey Rock were 1969. No kidding. And so how many yeah. people have you put through that program? Do you have uh, a read on that or? Uh, several hundred, I'm sure. It's been uh, about 60 in the last six years. So earlier years, it was smaller numbers, but now we average about 10 to 12 graduates a year. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Greg Anderson's a great friend, a longtime friend. He is out in Minnesota at Inspiration Point, a uh, camp that, where, where, Greg, was Inspiration Point named before or after Happy Days was on the air? They actually got the name from us. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, right. Those who have watched Happy Days know all about Inspiration Point. Potsy Weber, Fonzie, all those guys. So tell us about Inspiration Point, Greg. You're the president out there now? Yeah, we're located in West Central Minnesota, and uh, we're what people might think of when they think of a traditional camp. Uh, we're located in Lakes Country, and so uh, we're our activities are centered around the lake. We have about almost two miles of shoreline, and uh, we serve in the summertime uh, campers from first through twelfth grade family camps. Um, and throughout the year, then we operate uh, retreats and we work with churches and colleges and universities to help them accomplish their goals in a retreat setting. And then uh, another facet of our ministry is the is the uh, Checkpoint program, which is a nine month ministry training and leadership program that we run for typically nine to twelve students throughout the year. Is that is that a gap year program then? Do most of them it come is. There? okay? So they'll come there before they head off uh, to college then. Yeah. Right. Great. And then Andy Needham is up in, and you guys are all in beautiful spots, but I am really. Um, I'm bent towards New England. Um, that's just in my blood and my DNA from living up there for a while. And Andy's in a beautiful spot up at Camperia in New Hampshire. And Andy is, I, I think Andy's got a great position up there in terms of some of the unique things they're doing there and how they're serving churches in New England. So Andy, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so our ministry, we have a year-round camp in New Hampshire, Lakes Region, New Hampshire, which is sort of the hub of the operation. And um, we actually serve more uh, students in the winter season than we do in the summer, which is the unique thing about Northeast ministry, um, though we do have vibrant summer programs. We've also added a second location in Maine, which is just getting off the ground now. And then you can tell by my title, church is a big part of our focus. We try to orient a lot of our ministry towards equipping and advancing the church in the Northeast sort of the front lines of the mission field of, of the U.S. And um, so we, I, I oversee also regional conferences that we do to equip church leaders uh, as well. So that's, a, that's the, sort of the third leg of, of our ministry. Yeah, and, I, and I've been able to watch some of that really gain traction over the years. I think what you said there might get lost, at, you know, when you said the front line of ministry in the U.S., probably the toughest place in this country to do ministry and the most post-Christian, I would say, culture is the New England culture. And the further you move north into New England, the tougher it gets. And so you guys are really working hard, and I think effectively, as I've watched it grow, really effectively to equip youth workers and work with parents and pastors and others. So it's great. So it's great what everybody's doing. I want to start with Rob. Um, Rob's got a, a unique relationship with 3CA, the Christian Camping and Conference Association, in terms of heading the charge, being a part of a group that's doing some cutting-edge research on the power of camp, moving beyond just the anecdotal like, hey, those kids had a great time at camp, to look at with the data and out of the data that's coming out of some great research, the power and effectiveness of camp. And so youth workers and parents really need to be aware of that. Rob, talk a bit about what's being learned from the data, the research you guys are doing on camp. Yeah, it, thanks. Uh, it's been a really fun process the last two years, and this summer will be our third year. And the, the project I'm specifically working on is looking at the power of working at camp in the summer for the staff. 
Uh, there's a lot more research on what happens for campers and very little has been done on what happens to staff working in the camp environment. But what we're finding is that camp impacts uh, leadership ability, social and relational skills, critical thinking, uh, emotional intelligence, and a lot of the other uh, adult skills and workplace skills and ministry and life effectiveness skills uh, are learned in the camp environment for, for the staff that are working with the kids and running the programs. It's uh, They're solving real problems. They're having to meet real needs. Uh, they're having to work in teams to provide services and ministry to others. They're having to teach truth and wrestle with some of the principles of what God says in his word and communicate that to others. And all of this changes them in very significant ways and prepares them for a life of impact and effectiveness. Mm. So that's kind of the, the base of what we've been doing the last couple of years on that project. Rob, as you've been involved in camping over the years, when you hear the, the research that just came out, the, the, the change in the scope of adolescence. It came out in the, you know, the period of, of developmental period we know as adolescence. This came out just a few weeks ago that experts are now saying adolescence extends from age 10 on the low end up to age 24, 25. And we know cognitively that's when the brain is finally getting all wired up. Are are you seeing an increase in the value of what you've just talked about based on those realities with emerging adulthood or extended adolescence? I'm not sure if I've asked that question well or not, but it's... Oh, yeah. Great question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because I did my dissertation on the impact of camp on emerging adulthood and their formation of identity uh, about eight years ago when emerging adulthood and this whole thing of delayed adolescence was first coming out. Uh, and it's, I, I found it's, it's a significant impact. And I think especially from the areas of creativity, problem solving, relational maturity, emotional intelligence, especially with the impact of technology, delayed responsibility, all the stuff that's uh, part of this emerging adulthood change in our culture I think camp confronts it all, and I think camp is more needed than ever because it does such a good job of targeting some of the specific needs that have developed in the last 10 years in our culture. Yeah, I want to I jump in on what Rob said just a minute ago about um, the skills that staff are learning in the summertime. I think it was about a year and a half ago, Forbes ran a, a cover story on the skills that are going to be needed in 21st century uh, in the workplace or whatever. and and the article focused on the swing now, uh, the still important, the swing away from the, the STEM education, uh, science, technology, and, and so forth, to more soft skills based. And they said that the worker of the 21st century is going to have to excel in the things that Rob was talking about, leadership, problem solving, uh, working with working with others, um, diligence, endurance, those kinds of things that are inherently taught and and learned at a christian camp mm. so so would it be fair to say that for an employer that isn't a camp that it's a good thing to see on a recent uh, employee someone that's getting into the workplace that they've served at a camp absolutely yep. and what's yeah. been interesting the last few years uh is at the end of the summer one of the last things we do with our summer staff is we have them write some of the skills that they've learned over summer and what they've done over the summer. And they always write it in campy language. I was an archery instructor. And basically what we do is we train them <laughs> and teach them how to write that differently. I provided instruction to youth. Um, I had to work through lesson plans and we're trying to teach them how to put what happens at camp in employer friendly language because we still have the perception, I think, of most employers that camp is where you go to have fun in the woods. Uh, and so we're working hard, and that's why our specific research project is, uh, is focused on the staff, is to, to really get at the impact it has on preparing people for effective adulthood and contributing to society. Because we have to change the perception in camp ministry that it's, it's not just a place to go have fun. It's actually one of the best places to learn about leadership in life. Jason, we have a couple school districts that are are watching for 
the name Inspiration Point on a resume right now and a couple other workplaces too. We have an engineering firm that if uh, they're watching our staff and, and uh, if they're showing up uh, looking for a job at, this, at their firm, they have Inspiration Point on the resume. They know the body of work and the, the body of experience that they've captured during their time at, at camp and they're, and they're putting them at the top of the list. Mm. Let me ask this. Uh, let me let me go to Andy um, because he's been up at Camp Berea, and you other guys can answer as well. Um, but I think back to my first couple of camping experiences. The first one, I believe, I was in fourth grade, and I went to the Four Brooks. Well, it was called the Four Brooks Camp and Bible Conference in Pipersville, Pennsylvania, and I felt like the goal of that week uh, for me being at camp for the first time was uh, to get over being homesick uh, and also for them to keep me from being homesick. You know, deal with this kid who spent his first night crying, which I know happens a lot. And then the second camp I went to was Camp Sankinac, which is outside of Philadelphia. And, I like, I back then it was, I think, seen as, at least from my juvenile eyes and experience, uh, just a week away. And it wasn't so much that my parents wanted to get rid of me for a week. They wanted me to have a good experience. This was supposed to be a time of learning. But has camp really moved from that sort of thing to what Rob's talking about? And if so, what are some of the outcomes, let's say, Camp Berea, that that you folks are really, you and Nate and others up there, are really trying to work towards? Well, two things come to mind right away. One is, um, you know, we obviously influence the youth ministry culture in the Northeast. And I would say that our ministry has become a pipeline to to supply churches in our region. I would say, you know, in a similar way, as was mentioned with Inspiration Point in the school system, you know, uh, between myself and Nate Parks, we're often asked, hey, who do you know that would be a good youth pastor or children's director or family life ministry director in our church? And I mean, there's dozens of churches in our region that have have employed uh, former employees. I remember even for myself, I grew up working at a, at a Christian camp. It was my first eight years of full-time ministry. And then going to a church, uh, I, I just remember one of the things that stood out to them was that rather than talking about the the night of pool and pizza that I was going to put on, I talked about building teams. And that was something that I learned from working at a camp because you're, even as a young person, you're in these, these structures where you have people underneath you and over you and you're learning a lot more, than, like you know was said before, than just the skills of executing an activity. You're really learning about leadership. So, so those are two sort of you know direct application in my own life, and then things that we just see perpetuating uh, in in our region. Mm. Let me ask this: uh, We talk here at CPYU a lot about the cultural narrative. You know, this is what the culture is saying to young people about, and families, parents as well about you know, finding basic answers to the worldview questions or the developmental tasks, you know, two of the primary ones being identity formation, who am I, finding the answer to that question, and then worldview formation, uh, what do I believe? Anybody, you know, talk about what you've seen as the great benefits of camp, maybe as opposed to church youth group or being in a Christian family, supplementing those experiences in rewriting that cultural narrative to a better narrative, a more biblical narrative, a Christian world and life view that guides and directs. What are the advantages of getting away and getting to camp to make that happen? And specifically, I'm curious about some of the unique features of today's culture that sidetrack kids. So even if you want to speak to issues of technology, I'd love to to hear about that as well. Hopefully that question made sense. (laughs) Sure. I I can start. I know everybody will have an answer to this question. Um, A couple things come to mind. First of all, uh, here we think about the power of temporary community, and it's actually in the definition that 3CA provides of camp ministry. And as you mentioned, it's this idea of coming away. Um, but I think one of the most powerful parts of camp in the development and all the stuff that you were mentioning is that you actually do disconnect not only from technology, um, but from the patterns of behavior and the habits and the rituals and kind of the, the ways you behave just kind of out of habit at kind of a pre-conscious level, as James K. Smith talks about, um, camp, when you come away, 
and you're not in the place with the same people doing the same thing, it just it creates an openness, a sense of experimentation, um, and the challenges that come socially and physically, relationally, uh, even spiritually in this environment because you're with different people doing different things in a different time frame really opens people up to learn and to grow. Um, the other thing that comes to mind, and then I'll let others speak into this, is it's 24-7 environment. When you're at camp, you're with your leader in a very focused environment. At camp, we're, 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 we're trying to be purposeful about everything from the activities to the messages to even how we eat in the dining hall and what we eat and what programs are going on. All of that is focused very specifically towards the goals of our program. And so uh, being able to come away and be in that focused environment with leaders 24 seven who can see everything uh, and be part of the whole day and all the experiences is really powerful. I think being a youth pastor has got to be one of the most challenging jobs in the world because you see them for an hour and two on Sunday and then an hour or two on Wednesday, maybe you have lunch with them and there's so much life happening between those meetings uh, that how do you pull it all together and know what the student is really living and doing at camp we get to see it all yeah and you know for i i i think i speak for all, for most camps i mean our that idea of a temporary community that um, a, lot, a lot of students come to camp and they, and they do have a wonderful experience and oftentimes they say man i wish i could just stay here but that's not the point it's a, it's a temporary place. It's like Mount of Transfiguration. You know, Peter said, hey, let's put up tents here. You know, let's let's stick around. But the, the idea was to go back. And and the goal that camps want to uh, achieve is to be able to send them back, better equipped to face face life, better equipped to uh, relate and so forth. So that the temporary nature of that is is in support of what youth workers, what churches are trying to do or walking with them, uh, throughout the, the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, one of the things that um, Rob said too that I liked was that idea of following Christ daily. Um, I think a byproduct of what we're seeing in in culture right now, and we've read about this, is compartmentalization. So students are are because of what they're facing, they they have an online presence, and they have a this is who I am when I'm uh, at youth group on Wednesday night, and this is who I'm at who I am when I'm on the basketball court, and they really do get to see a an integrated, a holistic approach to life when they're at camp and they find out how things are woven together and that the call to follow Christ permeates and invades every, Walt, as you say, every nook and cranny uh, of life. And that's one of the things that happens at, at camp. Mm. We use a word picture a lot in our context and even use it as a brand for some of our events, but the idea of a greenhouse and this idea of a temporary growth environment that's an incubator that has, a, you know, there's control and there's nutrient rich soil and the right lighting and everything like that. And in many ways, that's what a camp is in the lives of our, our students is uh, it's an incubator for growth. It's not it's not the field. It's not where we're like you was said about this is not where we pitch our tent. This is not where we live forever. But it is this intentional temporary growth environment that's uh, just incredibly impactful in the lives of students. Hmm. I'm. Uh, this was said uh, just uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, Greg said it, Rob said it, but the idea of holistic experience and then everything is purposeful. Um, that was something that that Rob had said. I, I'm mm -hmm. I'm curious for the student what uh, if they are aware of this. Is that is that a point that that your team, Rob, would make that hey, this is purposeful. This is something that we want for you to to recognize. God is at work in all of life. And so all of what we are doing has a purpose. Or is that something that you hopefully uh, want for them to grab onto? Uh, what I mean by purposeful is that, you know, when we schedule an hour of this and an hour of that, those events are purposeful. And if, if done well, they're linked together and driving towards the same goal and vision for the program. So in our setting, my goal is that our leaders and the staff really understand the purpose of all the things and how they're look, linked together and what their job is to facilitate learning from one event to another event. Um, the campers don't get taught that. The hope is that they yeah. catch it and that it impacts them. And in many ways, it's happening to them and they don't even know it. 
Um, but the staff, for sure, have to understand all the pieces, how they fit together, and be really purposeful about facilitating the connections. Let me ask one more question before we take a break and just shift gears here a little bit. This is excellent. And, you know, it again, this is what excites me about camp because some of us are just, so many of us are just, you know, ignorant to this. But I want to ask about parents right now and a skill for parents that they need to understand is how to choose a camp. So maybe each of you could speak to that. You know, what would you say to a parent in terms of giving them advice about how to choose a camp for their child to attend in the summertime? Right. Um, but several, several things come to mind. I mean, it's no small, it's no small task and, and parents want to put their children in, in places where they know they're going to be cared for, where they're going to be safe and at the very least, where their kids are going to return, at least in the same condition as they were when they came, if not. <laughs> or better, <laughs> or, or better. Or, well, hopefully, hopefully better. But parents are looking, they think about preservation. I mean, they want, they, when we survey, when we ask our parents, what are you looking for when you send your kids to camp? I mean, they want them to grow spiritually. But I think deep down, innately, they just, they want their kid back too. So one of the first things I would ask if I were a, a parent and I was looking at, you know, several camps or several options, I'd want to know about safety. Is my kid going to be safe? And what is that? What does that mean? I mean, what do you, um, if you're on a lake, tell me about lifeguards. Uh, do you have people that are, that are uh, first aid certified? Uh, what's the hiring process? Are they going to be emotionally safe? Are they going to be cared for? Uh, how does somebody get a job there? Tell me about your training uh, that you do. How, is it, do they roll in um, on a Friday and the, the campers show up on the next day? Or is there a, as Rob talks about, is there a, is there a purposeful plan in place over over a week or two weeks before uh, before the campers even show up? Um, I I would go to a camp and ask for a tour. I'd want to see the facilities and knowing that I think the facilities are going to reflect if the facilities are cared for and they don't have to be brand new, but if they're if they're clean and and uh, safe, that's going to tell you something about about uh, the focus of the camp and how they care, they're care, they going to care for their kid. If, they, uh, if the buildings are a wreck and, and dirty and, uh, and so forth, I, um, that might be a reflection. So lots of, lots of questions to ask. Wild, the wildlife needs to be outside, not inside. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I guess to dovetail on that, the thing I would really focus on is the leaders, um, in the camp environment, that college or later high school student uh, is really the key piece to the impact of camp. Uh, we talk here at Honey Rock about the role of modeling. Um, camping has programming, modeling, and responsive ministry as kind of the ways we impact people, and programming is everything planned. Modeling is the counselor and the staff just living life, and the campers catching most of the time, more than's taught, more is caught than taught. Um, and so, so who the leaders are, how they're trained, the depth of training, uh, to me, that is the most pivotal piece of, of camp ministry is, is where are they getting their leaders from and how much investment in training are there? One question can ask is, uh, are what percentage of staff come back year after year? Because that's a mm -hmm. sign of health of a ministry as well as a deeper level of development in the staff if they're repeat people. Uh, but that's a major focus, I would say, as well. Mm. Andy, anything that's good, you can add? Yeah, I mean, some of this comes down to sort of our philosophy of ministry, but I, I definitely would consider, you know, if there's in environments that your church is engaging in a camping environment because, you know, as was said before, the camp is a great way to maximize uh, the relationships that already exist in temporary community. So take that youth pastor that gets an hour a week for 52 weeks, put them in a camp, all of a sudden, you know, there's hundreds of hours that can be spent together. So that would be another, um, you know, kind of resource that I would lean into. And it, it definitely at the same time, considering all the things that were already mentioned. Good, good. Well, this is good. We're going to take a little break and we'll come right back to talk about camp as summer's coming. And we know parents and youth workers are thinking about camp, and if you aren't, you should be. We'll be right back. Are you interested in bringing CPYU to your church, school, or community? 
A big part of our ministry is the on-site seminars we conduct in dozens of settings every year. CPYU seminars are designed to encourage and educate your audience on a variety of youth culture issues. Every seminar is designed to be informative, practical, and hope-filled. If you want to learn more about our CPYU seminars, available speakers, and the many seminar topics and options in our growing seminar lineup, go to our CPYU homepage at cpyu.org. Click on the seminar option on the menu bar at the top of the page, and you can learn more about how to schedule a CPYU speaker and seminar for your parents, youth workers, and educators. Welcome back to Youth Culture Matters. We're having a conversation on camp and its impact, and we're just picking up the conversation. We have several individuals here on the podcast with us. And so I just want to open it back up to conversations specifically for campers because uh, one of the things that we just discussed in the first part was the impact that uh, a camp ministry can have on those that are working at the camp. And I'm, I'm curious what kind of impact, uh, spoken and unspoken, that, that a camp ministry can have on the camper itself because there's, uh, in recent years, a lot of conversations around uh, – whether or not camp ministry is still relevant or whether or not it's having the impact that it might used to, to have. I know that in my own life it had a tremendous amount of impact, and that's where I first uh, came into relationship with Jesus. So I, I'm just curious from uh, each of you the impact that you see every year uh, your camp and other camp ministries that you have a relationship with having on youth and um, their experiences. Yeah, uh, I've got a great resource I'm looking at here on my computer, uh, Jacob Sorensen. It's a Journal of Youth Ministry 2014, so I think that would be a great resource to put up on the website after. But Jacob uh, looked at what happens after camp and kind of one of the best studies on that. Uh, and I'm just looking at a table, and I'll read a couple of points. Uh, likely his, likelihood to read Scripture alone weekly uh, or more, 15% of kids that did not go to camp versus 28% of the kids that did go to camp, so almost double. Pray alone daily or more, 26% non-camp, 37% camp. Say faith is very important or extremely important, 37% didn't go to camp, 53 did. Uh, regularly attend religious services, 29% for the non-camp, 51% for the camp. Um, so all that to say is that uh, and this is 2014 research. So th the impact of camp on helping campers with personalized faith, learning the habits and disciplines that are going to help continue to grow them in their faith, even after camp, uh, I think uh, camp's one of the best places for that. You know, think about one of the, one of the things we focus on is again, being the holistic nature of camp. And Luke 2.52 talks about Jesus when he was growing, that he grew in wisdom and stature and, and in favor with God and man. And that's really, that's a pretty good picture of camp, uh, that, that the campers, they have opportunities to grow in, in wisdom. They grow psychologically and, and emotionally and so forth. And in stature, as they're active during the day and, and they're outdoors and, and they're, learning about, uh, they're learning about play and creativity and, and so forth. They're in favor with God, obviously, as they're, their time intersects with uh, with scripture during a Bible study or a, a, a time alone, a, a personal devotions or a speaker perhaps, and then socially too, in favor with with their with their peers, learning how to get along, solve problems, how to how to grow together, how to support one another, how to encourage one another. Some real powerful ways that that all those things occur. And one other thing I want to mention when we think about campers that just Biblically, one of the reasons that camp works is because there's an intersection there of uh, general uh, revelation meets special revelation. That is, when campers come away into the woods, to the lake, the, the outdoors, um, the Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of the, the Lord, that the, the nature, creation speaks. Um, but it's in the pages of Scripture where they find out who the Creator is. We had a camper that came a number of years ago, and on the front end of, of camp, he, 
I think his parents, it was one of those kids that his parents made him go. But he told his counselor right on the outset, look, I, I don't want to be here. I don't believe anything you're talking about. Certainly don't believe in anything about creation. Um, so just leave me alone. The counselor wisely said, look, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're a part of our, our cabin group and uh, brought him through the week. And uh, the final day of camp, uh, the camper exclaimed to the to the counselor, hey, remember what I told you on Monday? The counselor said, yes, I do. And the, the camper told him, well, here's something I've learned this week, that Spitzer Lake, that's the lake that surrounds our camp, Spitzer Lake screams of a creator. And then he pointed to an area on the grass where the, the cabin group had met for devotions and for Bible study every day. And he said, and I met him right over there. And that's, uh, that's part of the power of camp, getting kids a, a, away from uh, concrete, from walls to a, a place in the outdoors where, um, where the world opens up to them and they're exposed to wonder and, and, and mystery and, and beauty in, in ways that we don't normally get to see in, in everyday life. And then we get to meet the one who's responsible for that in the pages of scripture. Yeah, I've, I've gotten to see that impact now. I mean, I've worked at a camp and a youth pastor, but now as a parent of a 12 and 14 year old. And oftentimes when I talk to other parents, the way I'll describe it to them is, um, you know, when, when my son Josiah goes off to camp, he'll come back home and he'll, you know, what did you learn? And he'll share some, some great epiphany that he has grasped from, you know, from scripture, who God is, his identity, the gospel. Uh, but it's something that I've been trying to teach him for the whole, you know, 14 years of his life. Uh, right. But it was that, you know, that other voice, <laughs> that other environment. Um, and as a parent, that's, that's something that I just want to, you know, I, I need those, those voices in my kid's life. I need that, that place where God is going to speak so loudly because of the, the environment, because of the intentionality of leadership and, and truth. And um, so I, that's, I, I've, I would tell parents all the time, if you want to know what camp is, in a nutshell, it's sort of, you know, it's other people speaking the same truths that you're reinforcing, but it's in a place that they're going to hear it louder than than they will in the rhythms of, of everyday life. Boy, you know, as a parent. Oh, go ahead, Rob. Go ahead. I was just going to say, Dan DeGroat from Global uh, Outreach Group in Texas has a saying. He said, camp is the most effective means to reach the most receptive hearts. And uh, I truly believe it. That's why I'm here. Mm. So, so Rob, you were that kid that Greg was talking about at Inspiration Point, right? You went on the run. Honey, no, you know, here's what you want to use his name. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to use that. Name. So, here's what I love about what Andy just said. You know, I know that feeling. Like, initially, you want to go, What in the what? You haven't been listening. What's right? You but it's, it's wonderful to have, and this is what I love about Youth Words. It's wonderful to have people other than you, mom and dad, in your, in your child, your teenager's life to say things that you've been saying. It doesn't mean they haven't heard it from you. It's just, you know, as some said, sound travels slowly. What you tell a kid when they're 15, they don't hear till they're 25. Or what you tell a kid their whole life, they don't hear till they go to camp or they're with mm. a youth pastor. And so to yep. come apart, that's a beautiful thing. Now that offers a good segue to a question I want to ask because when I travel, I get this question all the time from youth workers, and I'm getting it increasingly from parents, and that is when – do we put technology in the hands of our kids? When do we take it out? So the latest research, which is a couple of years old, says that tweens ages 8 to 12 are engaged with media or, and screens, you know, uh, about six hours a day. Teenagers ages 13 to 18, about nine hours a day. What about when they go to camp? Do you 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 folks probably have policies, and those policies are built around best practices because they work. What have you learned from that, and what can you help us understand? Maybe there's some good advice you can pass on to youth workers that they can employ when they have a Bible study every week or when they go away on a youth retreat or, you know, even parents about certain times during the day. What have you learned? What have you done with technology, and what have you learned from what you've done? We just recently, uh, I had a student do a research project and a presentation on this, and I don't know if uh, Greg and Andy would agree, but what what he, I think it was that he found was that uh, almost every camp restricts technology from the camper. So it's like campers don't get it, it's taken away. Um, where the differences come in camp ministry is how we respond with the staff. Um, but we found that that 
removing technology is critical. And one of the neat ways we've applied this, we have a gap year program too for 18, 19 year olds after high school, is we want them to learn how to responsibly use technology. But for the first 10 weeks of the program, we have a technology fast. And we actually purposely pull it away and they live without it. They can't touch a computer, see a TV screen, phone, nothing for that 10 weeks. And then when the 10 weeks is over, they go through a process of debriefing the impact it's had on them over a course of the week. And then they create a community covenant around how they're going to use technology the rest of the year. And it comes from the students. Nine out of 10 times, it's more restrictive than we would have come up with by giving it to them. Uh, and mom and dad love it because they actually get handwritten letters while the kids are on this technology fast. So really powerful things happen, I think, when you unplug. The biggest challenge, of course, is staff. And uh, it, it is a really hard thing to balance. How do you use cell phones to run camp uh, and at the same time, not have it be controlling them because they're just as addicted as the campers are. I like that. Handwritten like letters. That. Do you have to instruct wow. them on how to handwrite yeah. a letter? Or? Well, actually, this is hilarious. This is an unbelievable <laughs> story. I hope. Anyway, a, a college student came into the office two summers ago, and my wife works in the office, and my wife taught the college student how to put a stamp on and address the envelope. Yeah, that's not a criticism. Wow. That's a reality. She should, yeah, yeah, yeah it is that, a reality. She, she, yeah. she should have put that on YouTube. It could have been made available for thousands. <laughs> <laughs> that would have a lot of views. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. should have <laughs> oh, an envelope as a YouTube instructional video. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Andy, what about you? What do you guys do up at Camp Maria? Very similar. I was thinking of uh, just building on what was just shared. There's a, a typical part of our summer staff training where we uh, in, help the, the new staff learn how to go out and buy a $5 watch at Walmart because they, they don't own one and they don't know how they're going to keep time without the phone in their pocket. But it's it's very similar. And, um, you know, I just think it's profound. I think the, in some ways the challenge is, and it's been, been said in different ways, is, you know, parents are really desire their kids to be connected in, and helping parents understand that they they're actually reinforcing a bad habit um, when they're when they're not allowing you know kids to go away and, and un unplug so I think that whether it's guilt or fear or whatever that is I think that there's just so much power in helping our kids understand this the Sabbath rhythms of that camp provides in a digital sense and uh, I just think it's it's so profound and so important yeah. Greg what about you Greg yeah we'd be in the same place we um, we're technology free for campers and we we find uh, you know it's it's hard for them at the beginning, uh, like it would be for any of us. But what they find by the end of the week is we hear it so often, um, something to the sense of, boy, that felt good. It's the first time I was able to, you know, to relax and, and I didn't have to feel like I, I was missing out on something. And so there's a, there's a dose of relief. But yeah, I, oftentimes we, we have more of a challenge with parents who desire to remain connected to their kids. And uh, one of the things we can do as, as camps is to is to explain to them why we're why we're doing this. I mean, there are very few things in life that are that are meant to be done and performed constantly forever. Um, sat, the idea of Sabbath that Andy mentioned. I mean, anything whether we're whether we're exercising or eating. There's it's always a it's always there, there's an engagement period and there's a time of pulling away and resting and refraining. And that's that's a rhythm of life. And we can do the same thing with technology, and it's 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 helpful. And then we get to introduce the opportunity to be more introspective about it, and and to understand exactly the impact that social media, that smartphone use, is having on us. It's it's with us to to stay, but we can learn how to use it responsibly. And and I think we get a chance to talk about those things at camp. Yep, yep. It is interesting. One of the funny stories we have. I don't know if you guys have seen it too. Is when we collect the phones from the kids when they get to camp. Uh, I hope this isn't a criticism of parents, but some parents give the kids two phones, the old dead one and the one that's actually operating, and the kid gives the dead one but keeps the other one hidden so that they can still be in touch with mom and dad while they're at camp. <laughs> yeah, Rob, we, had, we actually had an extra one. There was, they sent another one beyond that because so when the kid got busted, they still had one. <laughs> oh, goodness. 
Because <laughs> oh, that's part of the challenge. Yeah, yeah, you know? that, but you know, that's that's telling us something. That's telling us something too. That I mean, parents want to know: are, Is my kid going to be okay? And, yeah, and again, it goes back to our responsibility to to make sure that the the programs that we're operating and so forth are going to help help parents understand. They're going to put them at ease to know that um, that we care too. That we're in local parentis, we're we're serving in their place here, and we're going to make decisions like they would make. Uh, for their children, whether it comes to feeding them uh, or, or caring for them and so forth. So that we have responsibility. And I think I think it's Richard Love in uh, Last Child in the Woods talks about uh, cell phones as the umbilical cord. Maybe that's from somebody else and mm-hmm. you guys would know. But uh, a big part of this is helping to train parents on uh, that safety like you were just talking about, Greg, but the benefits of being disconnected for a while. Uh, but it's really hard for parents to to not know what's going on every single minute and to know their kids safe and happy every single minute. And that that's increasingly a challenge for us in camp ministry because the parents are need that info all the time, which I understand because there's a lot of scary things happening in the world right now. Greg, you know, Does you're you're they... so hey, let me just hey, Greg, your your yeah. your response was so doggone positive there. I loved how you saw the wonder of that, because me, my initial reaction is, well, that's that's awesome. Those parents are teaching their kids how to be deceptive. Yeah, you know, it's just like, come on, what kind of? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Jason, go ahead, Jason. What does that? Does do, well, we does, might have just equipped parents interesting... to do the. <laughs> they guys said four phones now. <laughs> We'll do this. We'll do this again next year. We'll see how far we how far we traveled. <laughs> you just gave them more ways to be deceptive. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, I this is really interesting because does does that mean that you're now having? Because earlier, uh, Greg, you were mentioning that um, when you're looking at a camp, you look at the staff, the hiring process, the leaders. But has that made uh, the information that you provide parents change over the years? Uh, is is what you're giving to parents now different than what you had to give 10 years ago, not just because of technology, but because of the parents themselves? Oh, right. Right. I, I remember, you know, letters that I that I wrote 20 years ago to parents, uh, helping them prepare to drop off their kid at camp. And, and they were mostly interested in, you know, what's my kid going to do during the week? What's the schedule uh, look like? And uh, now we we have to lead with, with safety. I mean, our our communications to parents are all about the things that uh, that they want to know now. Is my kid going to be safe? Are they going to be watched, cared for? Uh, how are these how are these counselors trained? What is their character like? How can I be sure be sure that the that they're going to uh, care for my children well? Yeah, it's it's different. So many changes over the last you know decade or two. And another thing I found with that related to the parents is that back when I grew up camp is kind of what everybody did. It was kind of like normal and you didn't have to second guess it. Um, so now I feel like we have to educate parents a whole lot more on the value of camp, the impact of camp and the safety aspects, all the things we're doing to make it a powerful impacting experience. So there's a lot more parent education and in a sense convincing that camp is a very valuable, if not uh, critical uh developmental place and process for their kids. Rob, there was a, there was a, a survey done uh, probably, I think it was around 2004 or so. And I, I, I referred to it when I was working at, at 3CA, but um, we found that only 20% of Gen Xers actually went to camp. So that just backs up what you're talking about. That means uh, only one in five had a camp experience. So they don't know what it's, what it's about. So I, I understand that maybe it seemed like it was it had, camping had gone by the wayside, but here's here's what's happening. As our world, uh, I really believe this, as our world gets crazier and the, the questions rise and um, we're wondering what's the future about and we, we wrestle with those questions that Walt led with, you know, who, who am I? What's my point in being here? Um, is there any hope for the world? As those things increase, because of what camp stands for and what camp delivers, it's. It, I I really think that camp is becoming um, more and more of a uh, an answer to those, and it's becoming more and more desirable because it's standing in such a contrast to what we're experiencing every day. I want I want to follow up on that, Greg. What you just said, because 
I'm thinking about teens and anxiety off the charts. You know, number one healthcare mm-hmm. concern, depression would come after that. How have you guys seen the camp experience be something that decompresses kids, that allows them to relax more, to get out of the anxiety? Because from your perspective, you might be able to look back and say, okay, camp does this, but when we send them back, we wish that their their parents and their youth workers uh, were not heaping, you know, whatever it might be, back on them to rebuild the anxiousness. Does that make sense? You know, what? how have you seen camp work to to diminish anxiety and prepare kids better for life? Yeah. Um, Rob, your colleague, uh, Dr. Rich Button. Button. Yep. Yep. Uh, talked to, just in December, I heard him refer to a study where he was talking about the the impact of spending time of quiet in an outdoor setting and what that does to decrease anxiety. But beyond that, the study went on to find, and Rob, maybe you can find this out. The study went on to find that when being outdoors and being uh, being quiet and still, when that when you added water to the ingredient. So if they're sitting by a lake or a stream, it's like pouring gasoline on the results. Wow. It just, it just skyrocketed. Yeah. yeah. I got to get one of those little fountains in my office. That's just yeah. would be so <laughs> doggone helpful. <laughs> yeah. Hey, That's let- the beauty of working at camp is I can look well, at the lake uh, from my office. Yeah. Yeah. I'm jealous. You guys kill me. <laughs> You're in such yeah. beautiful places. It's horrible yeah. for us. But uh, there's something, you know, you know, we're seeing research tell us that, you know, some of the roots of, of anxiety is, is they're based in those questions you're asking. Who am I? How am I going to perform? How do I? And at, at a camp, they're, they're finding one of the things that kids are able to do is they step away and they can shed all of the, all of the, the pressures, the, the, the pressure to be someone, to live up to what they've, the persona that they've built through, through school, um, even, even their shortfalls, things that they've had to try to mitigate for years and years and years because they slipped up one time, maybe in seventh grade, and they've been carrying a burden for 10 years. They come to camp and they find that it's a great leveler. They get to just be their name and they get a, they get a fresh start and a new beginning. And And the other thing I think um, camp does really well, uh, but we have to be really intentional even more so these days is actually teaching campers and to be honest, college students, how to be quiet, how to be still. Uh, It is a very hard thing for them to be able to just be still even for 10 minutes. And so Mm -hmm. with our gap program, which is 11 months long, we start with short periods of solitude and silence. But by the end of the program, those kids are just craving whole days. But it's a skill that you actually have to teach. And I think camp is a great environment to teach it. Right on. I feel like, um, you know, so much of uh, adolescent experience now is about resume building for academia and achievement culture. And not that all of those things are are terrible, but, you know, what camp provides is something that it's still very purposeful and you're learning life skills and faith formation and character development is happening in very intentional ways. But it isn't just another. I mean, you know, we mentioned before that, yeah, it does have value for your experiences and will help equip you for the workplace. But I, I think we we would be remiss to say that that's the primary purpose. It's more about the formation of the soul and the heart and the character of the child. And, um, you know, so much of their lives is try harder, do better. And camp is an embodiment of the gospel to come and be in community and to not have to worry every day about, you know, just performing. Yeah. Yep. Amen. And yep. that's that's what sets Christian camping apart. There are great camps, wonderful great camps everywhere, but the beauty of Christian camping. And, and that I would add— you know, just as a dad and someone who was a youth worker, I would add that to the list of things I would check out when I'm checking out a camp. And I know the three of you with your respective camps, you've done that well. And most of the camps that I'm aware of, the ones I'm aware of uh, with 3CA, which will include a link to 3CA on the page, they're, they're like that as well. You're talking about, uh, you're selling me on camp even again, and I, I was already sold on it. But just a word to youth workers, maybe from the three of you, with your respective camps, could you each mention one specific, maybe non-traditional, out-of-the-box type program or something you're doing that youth workers can tap into or send students to 
that is really helpful in today's world? And I'm asking this because I know a bit of what each of you do. I'm giving you an opportunity. Does that make sense? Giving you an opportunity here to talk Absolutely. about? Yeah. Uh, the thing that comes to my mind is uh, gap years are really growing across our country right now. And I think it would behoove youth pastors if they're not aware of what gap programs are doing. But given that delayed adolescence stuff that we talked about earlier, um, a lot of kids, this, this idea of going from high school automatically to college isn't the best move. And so looking at gap years as a way to encourage your students to get uh, that time away, to get a sense of purpose and focused, if they've been in a high performing academic environment, to get a break from that before they launch into college and really get a sense of centered and purpose and identity through a gap type experience. Uh, I think that's one way. And then the other thing that comes to mind is uh, a lot of our camps uh, have some pretty strong leadership service ministry training programs. Uh, I know at Honey Rock we have uh, four week, six week, seven week kind of programs like that where students are coming away after uh, sophomore, junior, senior years and uh, actually learning ministry, doing ministry. I know a lot of youth workers are working on that, but students that participate in these type of programs can come back to the youth ministry and really be contributing leaders to the youth ministry in their upper ages of high school. So rather than see them as competition for what you're trying to do in the summer, I'm wondering if there's some students where it might be a good thing to place them in leadership stuff at a camp setting to equip them for a whole nother level of leadership back in your ministry. Andy, what Andy. Camp Berea. Yeah, I mean, I, I really resonate with what Rob just said. I mean, I feel like one of the key, the major keys in helping students transition as they go through adolescence and stay in the church beyond that is finding avenues where their leadership and service is developed. So uh, we have very similar. We have a two-week program that we do in the summer that's sort of in between a staff and a camper, camper disciples environment. And they get one-on-ones with our with our leadership staff. Uh, so they're with our directors each day. They have intentional um, discipleship through a book, and then they're actually doing some serving, and then they also get to play. So it's kind of a great hybrid, and a lot of camps do those type of things. We've had youth pastors say it's been one of the most impactful things as a compliment to their youth ministry, as, as was uh, referred to. So I think that finding those type of uh, incubators for your students is, is a great tool that Christian camping can provide for your church. Would you say something as well, Andy, about what you guys are doing at Camp Berea in terms of the off-site training for youth workers and others? Yeah, I mean, we're in a region where ministry is very unique and the workers are few, and um, we just have a burden to be equipping church leaders. And so we have uh, we have a number of one-day environments that help equip primarily volunteers, but we take the best of the vocational leaders in the region and put them on the platform, whether that's a breakout or in a large room environment. And uh, we've had about over... 2,200 lay leaders come to one of our conferences in the last year, whether it's worship. We'll have 500 kids ministry workers together this Saturday. We have a youth worker environment and some other ones. So, um, you know, that's another way that, you know, camps also can just be regional hubs of connectivity for the network of ministry in their region. So if you're new to an area, even as a ministry leader, I would encourage you to find out who's doing great ministry in your region, get connected to those camps, just to find out who the other churches and leaders are you can learn from. Uh, that's one of the things that we're real passionate about. Yeah. And any of the three CA members who are eavesdropping on this, I would love to, you know, challenge you to start doing these types of events. Greg, I'm thinking specifically about you folks at Inspiration Point, your work with parents. Yeah, a um, couple of the things that we're doing at, at Inspiration Point, uh, we want to we want to be able to equip parents to um, to to parent and understand the the waters that their kids are swimming in right now. Uh, we run a conference and typically uh, once a year, we call it I Point Equips, um, where we provide training for, for parents and for, for youth workers on our site. Um, another thing we just started doing a couple of years ago is we, we started a, a leadership retreat for uh, students in the fall, and it's targeted toward the students that are um, either perceived as who desire leadership within their youth groups, and, and youth workers are coming with maybe three or four students. And it's a it's a higher level training to teach them how to lead their peers, and how to be ministers among their peers. And so we're talking with them how to deal with their friends who are in crisis, how to um, uh, how to plug in, how to support your your youth worker. So we're working um, with those students who are 
who are either aspiring or finding themselves in in positions of leadership in their in their high school uh, in their high school days. But I think you, I think people can hear you know Rob and Andy talking about our our real desire is that you know for for camps we want to impact the church we want to support the church and the work that's being done uh, by our youth workers and really any, any way we can I think a lot of people in camping came out of a youth work a uh, youth work background. And it's our desire that uh, not only do we, send, do we send campers back better equipped to serve, but that we find avenues too where we can where we can support the work of the local youth worker, helping them, um, helping resource them, helping encourage them in what they're what they're doing. Uh, let me ask a last question here, and that would be, okay, I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm getting ready to send my my high school student, my middle school student, my child off to camp for the summer or for a week, let's say, you know, however long it's going to be. Give me some advice. I mean, you've talked through some of this, but give me a sentence or two, uh, a word to parents right now. What would each of you say to parents as they as they get ready to send their kids off? Uh, two things we encourage parents to do. Uh, one is have the child uh, contribute to the camp fee. So we do a thing at Honey Rock where we will match $250 towards the camp fee if the child earns and saves the money themselves. Uh, what this does is it, it helps build the anticipation in the child, but also helps them to develop ownership for the camp experience. So we have you know, 10, 11, 12 year old campers shoveling the neighbor's driveway, walking the neighbor's dog, watering their plants while they're gone, uh, mowing grass in the neighborhood. And that is building the anticipation excitement for camp all year long. And I just love it that, you know, the kids are participating in that and realizing the cost. Um, and then the other thing is uh, we encourage parents to work with their child before camp to talk them through what it's all about, especially if they haven't been before, but then to set some goals while they're preparing for camp so that Camp isn't something you just pack for two days before you go, but it's actually something that's part of preparation and conversation over a month or two leading up to camp. That's good. I might uh, I might add to to parents just to seek ways that you can help uh, support the experience and be careful uh, to not unknowingly uh, undermine it. Um, so here here would be an example: if your child's going to camp for the first time. Uh, talking with them uh, about encouraging them, telling them what what they can expect and so forth, and say, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be great. I know you can do this. This is this is really important. As opposed to, as opposed to saying, you know, are, are you gonna miss me? Uh, you're gonna get homesick and 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 those kinds of things. And and a lot of parents mean well in that, um, but it it can really uh, it can really almost uh, cripple the the child when they when they go away for the first time. And I think Rob's suggestions are, are fantastic. But to talk about them, I know one of the things we do is we have videos of each week of our camp that they can go back. It's their first time going to camp. They can go back and look at last year. What happened during this week? And give them a preview so that if they're wondering, hey, what's this going to be? What's this going to be about? They can get a little, they can get a visual uh, in a couple of things that came to mind. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that um, in this whole talk technology conversation, um, it's important. We, it's easy to project that on millennials or young people, but often it's 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 uh, transcendent of generations. And so for parents to one, not not skirt the rules, not send the phone, but also to be modeling that where are they finding Sabbath from technology in their own life? Where are they doing that? And how can that be a platform for conversation with them? about screen time, about all these, you know, great tools that we have and how to have healthy rhythms on using them and not. So I think camp uh, is a great tool uh, for families and, and can be used that way as well. And maybe we should uh, have the camper get taught how to dress and uh, stamp an envelope before they go too. <laughs> <laughs> Reading analog clocks and stamping envelopes, yeah. that'll be too new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, this is good. We need to wrap it up. Jason. Has this informed you? I mean, you've got little kids. I'm just wondering about what you're going to do. Has this changed any of your attitudes about camp? Uh, it hasn't changed my attitudes, but it's increased my desire for my kids to go to camp. It's it's reinforced what I've already believed. Yeah. So uh, I think this is really important. I, I think this is really important for us to have these conversations around camp because um, I, 
just uh, someone gave the numbers with regards to how few uh, of Gen X uh, went to camp. And these are who our parents are now. And so it, it makes sense with some of the data that we've discussed here on the podcast uh, why we need to talk about safety, why we need to talk about these things, because there is a there is a group of now parents who haven't had some of these experiences. And so getting them to send their kids off to camp means that we're not only uh, taking care of them, but sometimes we might need to be able to take care of the parents. And so I, I love what I'm hearing. It, it definitely reinforces and, and even uh, makes me think a lot about what it's going to look like when we eventually do that ourselves. Yeah. I want to thank you guys for uh, being on the podcast. We're going to include, as we always do, on the podcast homepage, which you can find at cpyu.org, all of the links to everything that's been mentioned. Rob Ribby, thank you. He's at uh, Honey Rock in Wisconsin, associated with Wheaton College. Andy Needham's at Camperia in New Hampshire. We'll include a link to Camperia as well and a link to Inspiration Point, where our friend Greg Anderson is at. And I want to let people know as well, we will have a link to the Christian Camp and Conference Association website, which is ccca.org. And if you go on that site, you'll see right on the front page uh, a tab, a place, you know, where you can click. And it says, Discover Camp. Find a camp, find a job. And so if you're looking for a camp, that's a great place to go. And if you want to work at a camp, these guys have talked about the just the, the wonderful experience of leadership development as you serve at a camp. And I know uh, our youngest worked at a camp for two summers up in Canada. Great experience for him. Made great friends, learned great lessons, had great leaders speaking into his life. And, and you know, I just say as a dad, Lisa would say as a mom, we'd love to see other parents experience the same with their own sons and daughters. So, guys, thanks so much. Thanks so much for being on this with us. And we invite everybody back to the next episode of Youth Culture Matters. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org.